can belief in God be properly basic? That's what we're talking about today on the show, Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I've got Dr. Tyler McNabb with me. He's the James Harden of Reformed Epistemology. That's the title that we decided on before we went live. And uh, so that's that's what we're talking about today is, is can belief in God be properly basic? We're going to describe what those terms mean. Then we're also going to be responding to a bunch of objections, including your objections. So if you have an objection to Reformed Epistemology or to the idea that God belief or belief in God can be properly basic, rational, apart from arguments, if you have objections to that, we're going to get to those. That's that's basically what this show is all dedicated to. So before we get to that, we're actually going to lay out what the view is uh, real, real quick and then address some of the more common objections. And then we're going to get to your objections. We'll get to those in just a minute. But before we do that, Tyler, let everyone know who you are beyond just the James Harden of Reformed Epistemology. Who are you? What are you doing? And why, why does this subject interest you? So, so I, I'm originally from Houston, like you are. And so... Uh, hence the, the James Harden reference. But uh, yeah, I currently am an assistant professor of philosophy at uh, the uh, University of St. Joseph in Macau. So I live right next to Hong Kong, for those who have no idea where Macau is. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, before that, I was a professor at HBU uh, in Houston, as well as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Macau. And so my specialty is in religious epistemology, uh, philosophy of religion more more generally as well, epistemology more generally. Um, and uh, I've got a few books uh, on religious epistemology, uh, uh, part of the Cambridge Elements series uh, called Religious Epistemology. And, uh, which I read this morning. Book, which he read this morning. And a uh, Five Views book with Bloomsbury, um, with uh, co-edited with John DePoe, and I contribute to it as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, another book co-authored with Eric Baldwin on planning as epistemology and world religions, uh, which I think we might get into some of, uh, related mm-hmm. material in this, this talk here today. So yeah, that's, that's roughly, uh, who I am. Right. Oh, let's, and contrary let's... to many people who add me on Facebook, I am not reformed. <laughs> uh, in fact, I am Catholic. So uh, just to clear that up, because when people add me on Facebook and they'll, they'll send me a little message or something, uh, they, they, they become very shocked to, to find out that, I, you know, I'm not reformed. I'm not uh, in the OPC church or something. <laughs> okay, well, someone just left a comment, and I have to pull it up right now, from Keegan Kidder. He says, if he were the James Harden, would he not be able to defend his arguments? <laughs> He's been really great on defense lately. Come on. Let's let's clear that up first led, led of all. Led the league in steals. Led the league in steals this year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He's super good at defense, by the way. This, I mean, they, when he first started out at Houston, he was he yeah. was doing pretty poorly. But as of the last few years, he's done an amazing job. I mean, if you just watch him, like watch any of his games recently, he's he's a beast on defense. Okay, let's put the let's get this comment out of here because it's garbage, and uh, yeah. let's let's get on to. What is reformed epistemology? What explain the term properly basic beliefs? I like to make a, a distinction between basic beliefs and properly basic beliefs. I think that's really helpful too. But let's get a sense of what the what the view is in the first place, and then we'll we'll address some common objections, and then we'll get to the the audience objections. Right. So uh, I guess it, w- it would be kind of important first to talk about. Uh, the, what the word justification means or what the word warrant means first. Uh, so uh, these terms can be used in different ways in the philosophical literature. How I like to use it and how I like to think about justification uh, primarily is in reference to uh, being sort of within you, in, in your own epistemic right. right? You, you haven't committed any sort of epistemic sin. <laughs> You're, you're within your right in believing a proposition. You're not, you know, being lazy or irresponsible with your belief forming. Uh, and so uh, that's how I like to understand justification. There, like I said, there are various other ways. But if I use justification right now, that's, that's roughly what I mean. And when I say warrant, I mean uh, that special ingredient, that special sauce, that when you put that on true belief, it turns, it blossoms into knowledge. And so you can have a true belief. Um, but uh, not know something, right? So uh, you could believe that the Atlanta Hawks will go 82 and 0 next year and win the championship and uh, never lose a game. Uh, but let's say, let's say that that does actually indeed end up happening. 
few people would think that you actually knew that. Few people would say like, oh, you knew the Atlanta Hawks were going to go 82 and 0 and win the championships. So you can have true belief, but if it's if there's a lot of luck in the situation, luck kind of dissolves. Uh, uh, it's kind of like acid; it dissolves knowledge. And so, if there's sufficient amount of luck in the situation, then you, you will lack knowledge. And so, warrant is that ingredient that when you put that with true belief, you, you have knowledge. And so, the idea of reformed epistemology, reformed epistemology, is the thesis that religious belief can be justified or warranted apart from argumentation. So that's not to say that there aren't good arguments for God's existence or they can't help us, you know, uh, increase our warrant or increase our justification or increase our, our confidence in the existence of God or in the resurrection of Jesus. Or even overcome defeaters. Uh, or overcome defeaters. Uh, I've, I've tried. I think I've put uh, <laughs> a, a few defenses of, uh, of various different arguments out in the literature that I support. And so I think arguments are good. I'm not against natural theology. In fact, as a good Catholic, I can't be against natural theology. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so uh, the idea, however, is just that it's not uh, you don't have to have access right, to these to these arguments. Your belief doesn't need to be based on arguments in order to be justified or warranted. And the specific view that I like to defend in the literature is a view called proper functionalism. Uh, and so let's take the belief, for example, um, that other minds exist. Few, few philosophers, I think, uh, at least it's not a majority view, are impressed with arguments for other minds. Uh, and so are we just gonna be skeptics about the existence of other minds? No, All right. So a lot of uh, epistemologists, most epistemologists in the analytic tradition, uh, are what you call externalists. Um, externalism just basically is the denial that we have to have access <laughs> to, you know, the arguments that confer warrant or justification on our beliefs. And so proper functionalism is an externalist view, and uh, it says no. Our our belief that other minds can be warranted, you don't have to have access to arguments. Hey, if it's the result of your cognitive faculties functioning properly, right, and your, your uh, cognitive faculties, so by cognitive faculties, I mean the sort of mental processes that, such as uh, uh, faculties that are responsible for producing um, uh, beliefs about what happened in the past. So, so you have a memory faculty, perceptual faculty, right, uh, beliefs that uh, in reference to what you perceive. Um, maybe you have an inductive and deductive faculty, right? aimed toward uh, processing arguments and inferences. Um, and so maybe you have a faculty aimed toward producing belief in other minds. In fact, I think cognitive science, so there's a lot of good evidence to think that we do have something like that. And so uh, if you take cognitive science seriously, then you, know, you think that our mind is sort of hardwired to produce belief in other minds, at least when it's functioning properly. And so the idea is that if our mind is functioning properly, when it produces the belief that, say, I don't know, Cameron, <laughs> I'm talking to Cameron right now, right? I'm talking to another person right now, uh, then, then my belief can be warranted, right? So you, your, your brain is kind of like a computer, and a computer has design plans, programs, and let's say its design plan is to produce the belief that Cameron is in front of me, or I'm talking to Cameron right now, and it's aimed at truth. My design plan is aimed at truth, and it's it's working rightly. So there's no malfunctioning going on. Uh, well, then my belief that Cameron, uh, that I'm talking to Cameron, can be warranted, even if I'm without arguments uh, for that belief. And so, reformed epistemologists, uh, the proper functional stripe, at least, they'll say things like, uh, "Well, hey, maybe we have a, a God faculty or faculties that are aimed toward producing belief about God and His activities." And if that faculty or faculties are functioning properly and aimed at truth, then our belief about God and his activities could be warranted apart from argumentation. And so uh, you might think like, um, you know, you pick up a flower in nature and you look at all the, the sort of the delicacies, uh, you know, the intricate design almost like of the, the, the intricacies of, of the flower. And you sort of just project teleology and project agency and, you sort of just find yourself believing that, you know, God created this or some transcendent being created this, right? Or maybe you look at the starry skies and you're in complete awe and you find your belief forming faculties just sort of 
produce the belief that, you know, there's some transcendent agent responsible for that or God created that. And so, uh, you know, that, that the idea is that if we're designed to produce belief about God and his activities and our faculties are functioning properly and aimed at truth, then um, our belief about God and his activities can be just far to warrant it apart from argumentation. Okay, so let's get to some objections. I think that that was a pretty clear explication of what the view is. Oh, what we didn't talk about was, <clears throat> we didn't talk about proper basicality. Let's talk about that real quick because that that's like in the title of this and it's also used in some, <laughs> right. it's also used in some, some, some atheists argue against properly basic beliefs. And we're actually planning on doing a video that's a little bit more in depth on this. But what is a properly basic belief and how does it relate to what you just said? Yeah, so I define properly basic, a properly basic belief is um, a belief that can be justified, rational, or warranted um, apart from, from argument. And so it's, it's basic in the sense it's not dependent on arguments. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you might hear the, the term culturally <laughs> speaking, right? Like, don't be basic or you're being basic, right? So the idea is that our beliefs can be basic. Uh, that's to say, though, that, that they're not based on, on arguments. And to say that it's properly basic just means that um, like, uh, it can be, it's warranted and justified, like you're within your right <laughs> and, and uh, affirming this apart from, from arguments, right? Maybe there's certain beliefs that our design plan uh, requires arguments for. And so while, um, uh, say, the belief in other minds, maybe that doesn't require arguments, maybe that's just sort of like an immediate belief that our faculties form, uh, perhaps there are beliefs like, uh, and the, the correct uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, maybe we actually do need arguments uh, for for that to be rational or warranted or justified. And so uh, if you just hold, say, you're like, ah, I just hold a Copenhagen view uh, of, of quantum mechanics, and but your design plan, your faculties actually are, are determining uh, that you need – arguments you need evidence to support this view well maybe your belief is basic but it's not properly basic so a properly basic belief would, would be a belief that uh that's warranted or justified and not based off of arguments that, that's the proper term so to speak so it's yeah. properly held an example that i like to use it, it, when i'm explaining what a basic belief is a basic belief like you said is it's not based on some other argument so it's basic it's like sort of foundational might be a good good term to use it's foundational and so here's here's an example that i, I like to use and I, I forget who i got this from but i got it from a philosopher for sure could have been uh clark I, anyways so the the idea for a basic belief is suppose that you went to the casino and you just found yourself believing on my next role or on my next move or whatever i'm gonna win a million dollars and you find yourself right. believing that that you maybe maybe uh you know, for whatever reason you have this belief, that would still classify as a basic belief as long as it's not based on some other belief or some other argument that you have. But you find yourself believing that. That would not qualify as a properly basic belief because it seems irrational. It seems unjustified. You're not warranted in holding that belief because it's probably false. You're probably not going to win a million dollars on your next role or on your next move or whatever. But here's an example of a properly basic belief. And a properly basic belief is a belief, a basic belief that you hold is reasonable, is rational, is justified, you're warranted in holding that belief. So here's a context. Say you are getting in your car, and this has happened to me before, you're about to get in your car, get out of your car, and you slam your finger in the door, okay? Mm -hmm. Super terrible situation, don't recommend trying it out. But you find yourself with the belief, I'm in a lot of pain. In that context, in that, that belief, let's just stipulate it's not based on any deeper belief that you have or deeper right. argument. You didn't like think up an argument in your mind and, and go like, well, this, you know, my experience is best explained by the fact that I'm in pain and blah, blah. Like that didn't happen. You just found yourself with the belief, I'm in a lot of pain. And in that context, it seems like that's a really reasonable belief for you to hold. It's very justified, you know, justified, rational, warranted. So that's a properly basic belief, a belief that's not based on any other argument, but is nevertheless rational for you to hold. I think that that should be helpful for some people. Now, some people object. Yeah. 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 So uh, it, it, some people object to the to the idea of properly basic beliefs by saying, well, look, 
theists, Christians who are giving this argument, the giving this view, are just trying to avoid any kind of burden of proof. They don't want to give arguments. They're just trying to avoid it and just like, you know, I, I'm justified regardless. I can just still have my belief and I can be, you know, I can have justification and warrant and stuff. And I, I don't need to give a whole, lot of, a whole lot of arguments. How do you respond to that? Yeah, so um, nice uh, way to psychoanalyze me. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I would say uh, that perhaps they, they don't know this, but I try to show this uh, in my Religious Epistemology volume, and Andrew Moon does a really great job at showing this in, in his uh, Philosophy Compass article. Uh, and that's most contemporary uh, accounts, mo most contemporary epistemologies that are endorsed, that are widely endorsed. Uh, are uh, compatible with Reformed epistemology. And so it's not like this ad hoc move that like theists are special pleading to a particular epistemology that no one else adheres to just so they can, uh, you know, get away with saying God's properly basic. I mean, this, this is something that, that uh, the idea of properly basicality is the mainstream view in analytic philosophy, of, you know, analytic epistemology. Uh, and so you, you mentioned say, your five views book. I would just uh, to to reiterate or to to build on right. that. In your five views book, four out of or, or I guess five out of six of the authors endorse basically on their on their view is compatible. Most of the views right, right. are compatible with Reformed epistemology, and there was only one right. person in the book who argued right. that the, you know that Reformed epistemology is false. Of the five or six different people that right. are that were talking about religious epistemology, only just one of them had a view that was inconsistent with it, which I think is really interesting, really telling of where right, sort of right. things are going and yeah, and what's behind all the views. That was one of the, that was one of the happy things that, uh, I thought that the proper functional view was different at well, but the, the idea that reformed epistemology was seemed to be widely agreed upon, I was, that was kind of one of my main takeaways from the book. But uh, yeah, so uh, I would just sort of suggest and say, okay, well that's nice if you think that's what's going on, you know, uh, maybe, okay. Uh, but why why don't you deal with the arguments that I've given uh, or that Planning has given, right, or that people like Kenny Boyce and Andrew Moon uh, have given for proper functionalism and, uh, you know, take each condition that's uh, articulated and, you know, see if they're necessary or jointly sufficient. And, and why don't we go from there? And then uh, once we establish uh, the, that the epistemology is plausible, right? Or, you know, give me uh, your epistemology, you know, do you endorse phenomenal conservatism, do you endorse a process reliableism or virtue reliableism, like, what's going on here? And then, uh, you know, I can show you classical how foundationalist. All... Exactly. And so we, we can kind of talk about the epistemology, debate the epistemology. That's that's kind of how I would turn. I would I would turn the conversation less focus on me, more focus on debating the sort of epistemological systems that are being espoused and then show how uh, you know, which systems are compatible with reformed epistemology, and that's to say, you know, most of them. And so I, I think that's that, that would be the approach I'd take to that. All right, so here's like the number one response that I see in response to reformed epistemology. The number one objection, it looks at like what, some, some of these other, like Muslims could use the same strategy, Hindus could use the same strategy. So a lot of people could use the same strategy and say, well, oh, look, well, I'm justified, I'm warranted in my beliefs, and so there, you know, game over, so to speak. And so this is supposed to be in some sense like a, an argument against the view because these other people could have a justified belief in their religion. But anyway, so it's a religious disagreement. There's, there's people who have different beliefs and all of them can't be true all at once. So doesn't this in some way provide an argument or an objection or defeater against reformed epistemology? Right. No, that's, the, I think, a, a very popular objection. Uh, I remember, so I, 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 especially when I was uh, in America and then in the UK, I did a lot of street evangelism. And uh, I remember one time uh, I was actually like articulating reformed epistemology, right? Like in the open air, right? Open air street preaching. Um, and uh, I had this random guy just kind of like walk up to me and I, I, he, some sort of view or religion, he just spouted out and basically tried to mimic what I said about reformed epistemology or what I said about uh, theistic belief more generally and then after he said it he was like case closed and he just started like walking really fast away and i'm like no come back here talk <laughs> with me this would be a really interesting conversation 
And uh, yeah, so I, I definitely think a lot of people have these these sorts of feelings. And not not just about reformed epistemology, but just religious diversity in general, right? Uh, does religious diversity pose a threat to people who want to claim that they are part of the one true religion, or that you know their religion? Uh, contains the propositions that are the most true, at least <laughs> more true compared. They have more true propositions than it compared to, you know, other religions, something like that. Um, yeah, so we can go in several different directions here. Um, first off, uh, oftentimes what's being assumed here is like an equal weight theory. Uh, so the idea is that if if you're an epistemic peer, that's to say, you know, you've read all the good information, <laughs> all the relevant literature uh, about in this context would be religions, my religion and your religion, uh, assuming that, you know, we both want Christians. Um, and uh, assuming that, you know, we're roughly, you know, the same intellectually speaking, right? It's not like uh, I suffer from uh, severe cognitive uh, disabilities such that, you know, I'm just not capable of thinking really abstractly and you are or something like that. So we're, we're epistemic peers, right? And so the idea is if we're both epistemic peers, you know, um, then if, if we've exhausted communicating with each other, I've shown you all my arguments, you showed me all your arguments, and we're sort of just at a standstill. Well, this, the equal weight theory says that we need to give equal weight to each other's beliefs, our, our opinions. And so some people who advocate for the equal weight theory will say that um, we need to meet each other halfway. <laughs> so if my belief's like up here in Credence and yours is here, right, we need to sort of come down right uh, an, an equal amount right um or some others take it even more you know an even stronger view and that's to say that they should just be completely agnostic about their belief so whenever you have genuine peer disagreement you just need to with you know withhold uh, uh refrain from from your belief and this seems to be i think at the heart of a lot of religious disagreement um at, at least those arguments that are trying to you mean um, arguments from religious disagreement, right? To to show that Christ, uh, you're not rational in believing that Christianity is, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one gets the Father but through Him. Uh, and yeah, I don't think that the equal weight theory is very good, right? So uh, first off, right off the bat, um, I've read a lot of literature on the equal weight theory. Uh, let's say that you have as well. Let's say that I affirm equal weight theory, but you don't. Let's say we're both also epistemic peers, that we've all read the same literature. <laughs> Would this mean that I now need to refrain from affirming the equal weight theory? <laughs> so you, you can have this sort of self-defeat worry about the equal weight theory. Um, it, also, it's just not really realistic, right? We don't, a lot of us don't think this way when it comes to, say, politics or science, right? We're not telling, going back to quantum mechanics, right? We're not like, hey, you person who endorses a non-realist interpretation of quantum mechanics versus the person who endorses a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics, both of you need to suspend your beliefs because y'all are epistemic peers and y'all have disagreement. Uh, we, we don't act like that, right? Uh, with philosophy, surely we don't, right? You're an A theory about time. You're a B theorist about time. Okay, well, I guess we all just need to suspend <laughs> suspend uh, our free will, yeah? or if you want to get theological, Calvinism versus Arminianism, right? I mean, uh, we, we don't treat uh a lot of our beliefs uh like that we don't we don't think that they're undermined by an equal weight uh consideration uh i mean planning again and there's one uh, more uh, yeah 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 oh, there's there's one oh. more argument against equal weight theory yeah right right well it, you, you maybe this is what you're thinking um and that's uh you know you might just think that we're not epistemic peers <laughs> um so maybe my faculties are functioning properly and I think that they are, and I think that yours aren't. And so then the equal weight theory wouldn't, you know, uh, sort of develop into a defeater for my own belief. Um, I was going to say real quick, Plenty gives a really nice example, I think, of when, when there's disagreement. He gives it in reference to moral disagreement. So he, he gives an example where it's like, let's say that uh, I believe that it's wrong to lie about your colleague in order to advance your career. And you don't. Let's say now we've over a beer, we've uh, debated about this all night. We've heard each other's arguments. Uh, and again, let's, let's assume we're intellectually, you know, on par with each other. Um, well, I think few people will think that uh, I have to abandon my belief that it's wrong to lie about 
that it's wrong to lie about your colleague in order to advance your career, right? Few people would think that I need to abandon that belief. And so, yeah, I, I think you can go that route. Um, what I uh, believe I mentioned this um, uh, in my uh, book with Baldwin on world uh, religions and planning epistemology. No, imagine that uh, you wake up one morning and uh, there are some people who, who say to you that the past was just created. Uh, five, uh, everything was just created. The universe was just created five minutes ago and things just appear old and we have, we were created with all these memories and you're like, what's going on? You know, little do you, did you know, like people drank some water and something was in the water and made people believe all sorts of crazy beliefs about this. And let's say like you're arguing with them and, and, and all your arguments, you know, point to both directions and, and there's really no movement going on. I mean, it seems like you're totally rational and continuing in your belief that, you know, the universe wasn't created five minutes ago with the appearance of age. And so, I mean, this is the same thing. I, I don't see why these sorts of arguments against the equal weight theory and, and just against, uh, against diversity posing, necessarily posing a problem in, in general uh, have to harm uh, our credence in, in any way, shape, or form. But more specifically, if we wanted to really get uh, from a proper functionalist approach, uh, the book that I co-author with Eric Baldwin um, we uh, argue that actually lots of different religious traditions can't make sense of Planiga's epistemology. And so uh, Planiga argues, uh, and both in his warm proper function uh, volume as well as his debate with Thule, which I highly recommend for anyone who has taken a look, called Knowledge of God, um, he argues that actually naturalism has a hard time accounting for proper function. So there are proper functionalists who are naturalists, like Peter Graham, great you know, great epistemologist. He's a naturalist. He advocates for proper functionalism. Um, uh, Ruth Milliken, you know, so, so I think Ernest Sosa basically endorses something like proper functionalism. There, there, there are naturalists who believe in proper functionalism. But planning of things that actually they really can't make sense of proper function. And so if that's right, if basically in order to really account for your cognitive design plan, <laughs> right, in order to account for the cognitive programs, you need a, a, a designer, so to speak. You need uh, a code writer. Uh, then uh, you're going to need some sort of consciousness that exists outside of human biology, you know, that, that exists outside of humans. And so uh, lots of religious traditions right, uh, don't have this. So a lot of uh, traditions within Hinduism, uh, traditionally within Buddhism, you know, there is no conscious uh, being that, that exists in uh, an objectively sort of real way and sort of use Kantian terms, right, in the noumenal realm. Uh, and uh, so you have this, you know, pantheistic uh, traditions might struggle with this. You, you also have the idea that, like, the design plan, you know, the story about the design plan, um, you know, that were probably the most famous objection that I have when I encounter, uh, talk about reformed epistemology and uh, Christian circles, right? Christians will often say, well, what happens? What, what do you do with a Muslim? Uh, who's, or, sorry, not, not Muslim. What do you do with a Mormon who comes to you and the Mormon says, well, hey, I just read the, the Book of Mormon and I just feel it in my heart that this is Burning true. in the you bosom. Know? Can't they say that? Right, exactly. And so, you know, one way that Eric and I have responded is if you don't think that um, uh, there can be... Uh, actual infinities, right? Or at least um, there, there can't be a number of, uh, uh, an actual infinite number of years, for example, that the universe has existed. If you, if you think something like this, right? Maybe the um, um, Reaper paradox or maybe traditional, you know, Craig's uh, arguments that he gives in reference to the absurdities that kind of occur when you uh, subtract infinities from infinities, you know, whatever, traversing actual infinites. Uh, if you're persuaded, for whatever reason, uh, that the universe can't be infinitely old, and yet your your religious tradition espouses that the universe is infinitely old, moreover, it espouses that our cognitive faculties came about from this infinitely uh, old sort of process. So take from Mormonism, um, where you have Elohim, who creates our cognitive uh, faculties who creates us but he was just like us at one time right just a man like us 
And there's this kind of idea that Elohim, when he was just a man and obta- before he obtained godhood, right, there is another god. <laughs> and, you know, there's this kind of idea that's strongly hinted at in the Mormon literature uh, that there's just sort of like this infinite regress of uh, gods, so to speak, who create different universes. You know, they're a human at one point or something like a human, and then they obtain godhood and they have their own universe. And uh, they create their own peoples, and then you might have people from that universe <laughs> uh, uh, go out and obtain godhood, and you know the process continues. And so, uh, uh, if this is the story about how our cognitive design plan came to be, um, then you know obviously you're just going to think it's impossible. You're going to think that on Mormonism, you really can't intelligibly make sense of how we have a cognitive design plan, similar to the atheist or um, the Veda Vedanta Hindu, is, uh, Hindu or the uh, Buddhist, right? You're going to think they're, they're not going to have the resources to make sense of cognitive design plans because there's no God, no personal God, and, or something like a personal God. And uh, so I, I, think, I think this uh, in Hindu cosmology, even for those who, uh, Hindu traditions um, that espouse sort of a personal theism, uh, or, or at least something close enough, it, typical Orthodox Hindu cosmology is that, uh, you know, the... the the universe is infinitely old, right? You have these sort of rebirth cycles of, of the, of, of the universe. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you're just going to think that this sort of story of have our cognitive design plans impossible on that tradition. So they're not going to be able to say the same thing. If that tradition was true, even assuming that tradition is true, um, if this is really required for, for proper function, you know, theism or the universe isn't infinitely old, you know, uh, then these these uh, uh, traditions just won't, won't be able to be warranted. You can't say the same sort of thing that maybe the the, the uh, Judeo or uh, Christian can can say. And um, yeah, so you, you you have this sort of response. You also have a concern like Plantinga talks about cognitive design play needs to be um, aimed at truth, right? You have some worry, uh, I think, on on Islam. Uh, about uh, this, at least more so than you do on Christianity. Um, in the Quran, um, God uh, talks about how great of a deceiver he is. And uh, in fact, um, he seems to, I think, the most common sense interpretation to Surah 8 is that God deceives actually Muhammad and his cohorts and his, his uh, soldiers and uh, makes them believe something false. For good, you know, uh, God's not being like bad or mean. <laughs> He's helping them by deceiving them. There's actually some sort of like uh, counterfactual that Molinus would really like, I think, defined in Surah 8. Um, basically, where if God didn't deceive them, they'd get crushed. So God deceives them, so they wouldn't get crushed, right? Um, and so maybe you think that this should cause some, some worry, given that God deceives the good, not just the, the evil uh, doers and God boasts about how great he's deceiving. You might think it's analogous to like uh, a um, general who has this like nefarious technology that can, uh, he can use some sort of like laser gun, shoots his soldiers to make them form false beliefs, maybe to encourage them so that they act more bravely in battle. And then all of a sudden after the battle's over and you won, uh, and the general's like, ha, yeah, I use this gun. In fact, I'm so good, no one ever realizes when I use it. And you're just like, how many times have you used it on me, right? And maybe this might start to worry and cause anxiety uh, uh, in you. And, and so it might actually affect whether or not um, you will have a defeater for your belief. And I think traditionally with even more, rele- uh, more relevant to whether a Muslim can utilize proper function, uh, uh, I think the sort of orthodox philosophical tradition within Islam uh, uh, sort of stipulates that one needs to uh, have access to arguments in order for the belief to to robustly uh, sort of constitute knowledge. And so you have this idea where you do have this faculty like Plenica calls the census of Anatotas. It does produce a sort of immediate belief, but then uh, it's also design you also have faculty designed to sort of produce doubts and you're supposed to overcome these doubts by being faithful to the quran and trusting the quran to see if it's you know really uh god's word 
And, you know, and then, and then you, this sort of develops into you searching for arguments, accessing evidence, and, and then really sort of coming, constituting true robust knowledge. And so uh, there is a, a, a great philosopher out of Turkey, a uh, young philosopher, really sharp. Um, he has, uh, Jamie Turner, he has a paper that responds to me in Baldwin and argues that that's not the case, but, you know, I digress for now. But there is that sort of debate, you know, whether Islam sort of inherently has this sort of uh, requirement. And so, yeah, I mean, when, when, you, when you think about it, when you actually look at all these religious traditions and what's required, maybe they actually, a lot of them don't actually have the resources to make sense of proper function the way that Judaism or Christianity does. And so uh, that's one way that, that you could also uh, go about this. Um, but honestly, at the end of the day, like, I'm just fine with disagreement. Like, so what? <laughs> Your religious tradition, you, you, you know, you can say that if Hinduism is true, then, you know, Hindu belief can be warranted. OK, you can also say that, um, you know, if the past was created five minutes ago in the, with the appearance of age and your faculties were designed to produce that belief. And you, if your faculties are functioning properly, then that belief can be warranted. OK, you can make that move. So what? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not moved. It doesn't affect my own belief. It doesn't sort of move me and decrease my credence. I'm just still finding myself believe that the universe wasn't created five minutes ago. So, you know, that, to the hell with disagreement and I'll continue on with my belief. And I think that that sort of move is totally fine for the Christian as well. Okay, so let's do uh, let's do this. So there's one more objection that I want to cover before I turn it over to the audience to give their objections. So after I give this objection, Tyler starts to responding. You guys can start putting your objections in the live chat. I'll be looking at the live chat right now. So as after I give this, go ahead and start putting them in there. All right. So here's here's a worry that is not necessarily something that you see from atheists. It's actually something I've heard from other Christians who even, even other apologists. So here is the objection. Basically, Reformed epistemology is in conflict with the program of doing apologetics in the sense of it gives people a sort of way out or an excuse not to look into arguments, not to look into the evidence for Christianity. Because if you can be warranted and rational and reasonable apart from arguments, then why do you need to go and look at, you know, mm. the, the, the arguments? Why, why do you need to do apologetics if apologetics isn't necessary? Yeah, sure. There you go. So uh, I would first respond to that kind of similar to how I would respond to the person who thought that saying that God, a belief in God's properly basic is ad hoc or, you know, silly. Uh, I just sort of go back and say, okay, well, let's, let's start from, from the basic. Let's, let's talk about epistemology. Uh, here are all these different epistemological theories that all seem compatible with performed epistemology. So do you deny that? Do you deny that they're compatible? Do you deny that maybe some of them entail it? Do you, do you deny that these epistemological, you know, uh, theories are, are true or accurate, whatever? Um, and so I, I think, honestly, I would go there. And if they, if they you know, would, would sort of accept it, oh, no, I do think, it, you know, one of these sorts of uh, theories, is, uh, you know, uh, one of these theories is true. And I do think that it's compatible with the foreign epistemology. Well, then where's the objection exactly? What's the objection? You just like pragmatically not like it, but like you sort of mentally in the back of your mind kind of agree to it. But you're just like, ah, the humbug, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're kind of like the Uncle Scrooge of reformed epistemology. You're just you're, you're, you're not into it. Um, it's fine. Um, but at the same time, I think that it's extremely helpful. And I noticed that uh, when I've preached, street preach, and I've sort of talked about reformed epistemology, people have found it very helpful. And so uh, I know for me, I, I, when I first um, started getting into philosophy before, you know, I was uh, even a graduate student, I got into some really bad epistemology. And I thought that in order to know P, it had to be such that I couldn't be wrong about P. You know, so uh, I bought into this really hard sort of Cartesian uh, foundationalism and, and, and uh, uh, a really hard version of it, um, where uh, like so, some, something harder than, than even the McGrews would endorse for those listening who, who are familiar with, with uh, their work. Uh, I thought literally in order to know any proposition, it was such that you couldn't be uh, wrong about it. All beliefs had to be incorrigible if they were to constitute knowledge, right? And so... Uh, that I mean, I word that you used real quick like, was incorrigible. Yeah, you went, you went kind of fast it. over it. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe it didn't uh, 
process for people. Right. In, yeah, you you believed that you you had to have sort of infallible knowledge. Knowledge had to be infallible. Right. Yeah. And and uh, so I was like really worried. I was like, what if one day I through street evangelism I encounter I don't know say a philosophy professor. Uh, again, I had no idea I was going to be a philosopher at the time. And uh, what if I give him an argument or her an argument for God's existence or for Christianity being true. And they show me that like all my arguments are totally suck. And, you know, I just, uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And there are like way better alternatives. And I think about it and, you know, a few days go back uh, by and I do a little bit of research and I still have nothing really to respond to them. Uh, Am I like irrational now? In my faith, you know, do I no, no longer know that Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so? And, and this brought so much existential angst. I was just in complete disarray. And I actually went through a depression for about a year where I was just like, someone's going to come up with an argument, you know. And and I was just like really worried that someone was going to come up with an argument uh, that would uh, to show me that, you know, my arguments uh, aren't very good. And so uh, finally, when I read Planiga's work, I realized it was like very free. It was like, no, I can trust my experiences. If something seems to me to be the case, that's kind of like the default. It's innocent until proven guilty. I, you know, I trust what seems to me to be the case. And if it's the result of properly functioning faculties aimed at truth, then my belief would be warranted. And true, if true, then I'd have knowledge, right? And so, uh, yeah, that, that, that was very helpful to me. And it, it became helpful to me because uh, not only for – anxiety reasons, but also because it allowed me to be more objective, I think, about natural theology. Uh, so my faith um, wasn't dependent on arguments and so uh, for, for it being rational. And so I was able to really examine these arguments from natural theology and say, are they good? I mean, I don't have to say that they're good. It's not like I'm, you know, uh, betraying my identity uh, or my love for Jesus if all of a sudden I think that this argument is no longer good. And so I, I thought it was really freeing and allowed me to be even more objective about arguments. And again, arguments are still important. Uh, in times of doubt, yeah. maybe you start questioning your experiences and like, what if it wasn't real? And you just, you know, it, maybe arguments can help you or increase your faith. Or maybe you're like, yeah, I do find myself believing this, but like your credence is like only this high. But then all of a sudden you look at arguments and then all of a sudden, you know, skyrockets. Uh, and so arguments can still be very, very important in an apologetic setting. Yeah. Here's another thing. Cause you, you mentioned a couple different responses there. One was to be like, okay, well let's, let's actually do the epistemology. Let's do philosophy. Let's go back to the epistemological theories, see which one is true, which one is compatible with reformed epistemology. If you think it's incompatible, then what's your argument for that? So I really like that move. And I wish that people would understand that that's a move being made and you can't avoid that. You cannot avoid right looking at the epistemological theories that are on offer that a lot of epistemologists accept and deal with those and see whether or not reformed epistemology fits with those theories. You got to do that step. If you're going to argue against the theory, you've got to do that step. But then you also said that it can be helpful in certain ways. And here's one way that it's been helpful in my, my own journey is when I came to endorse reformed epistemology after I studied it for some time, I discovered that it was actually able, I, I was actually able to look at arguments more objectively after that, because I wasn't relying on this argument to sort of ground or justify my belief in God's existence, I was able to really look at this argument and be like, I don't need this argument. If this argument fails, then I can just, you know, disagree. I, I can just disregard it. I can get get rid of it. And that's actually led to me, you know, the, the moral argument. I'm not a super big fan of the traditional moral argument. I think that more arguments for moral knowledge work. But like there was a time when I, I wasn't really sure about the Kalam and this was during this time where I was endorsing reformed epistemology, not thinking that I've got to have all of these arguments. So the point though that I'm that I'm trying to make here quickly is that it's allowed me to really look at these arguments from not completely an unbiased perspective, just because I think we all deal with bias, but it's helped me sort of overcome some of my inherent bias and thinking that I don't need this argument necessarily in order to have a justified belief that Christianity is true. So then I can just look at these arguments for what they are, assess them, reject them if they're, if I don't think that they're any good. And so that's one way that reformed epistemology can really be helpful in a way. I think that a lot of other worldviews, a lot of other epistemological views can't 
the atheists, I, I don't know if they can, they, they can be as unbiased as someone who endorses reformed epistemology mm. and, and is a Christian. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah, okay, let's I, get... I, I think that's right. Uh, if I can say something really uh, yeah. quickly. Uh, and this isn't something also, it's worth pointing out, that this isn't something that like philosophers in the 20th and 21st century sort of just invented <laughs> so that you know they could uh, get past you know, uh, all the arguments in analytic philosophy, uh, you know, that are, are uh, pointed at theism or something like that. And this is something that's endorsed. Calvin talks about it in his institutes. Uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, endorses reformed epistemology. Uh, I think maybe Gust Augustine might. Um, I think Paul does <laughs> in Romans 1. And so, I mean, there's this long standing tradition. I mean, this is not some sort of ad hoc. Uh, uh, sort of approach to handling the rationality of theistic or Christian belief. This is something that's quite, I think, well grounded in, in the Christian tradition. So, just worth. All out. right. Yep. So here's a question from Harley Wikes. Thank you for sending this as a super chat, Harley. She says, "Can an Arminian believe in Reformed epistemology?" Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, there's uh, plenty of actually uh, talks and places about like kind of being regret, like uh, regretting that it's called reformed epistemology, right? So it's called reformed epistemology primarily because this idea of a, of a sense of divinity within your cognitive faculties, right, is, was uh, Plenigo's interpretation of book one of the institutes where Calvin talks about this faculty uh, or knowledge, however you want to gloss it. Uh, and so he, you know, he calls it reformed in that sense, uh, inspired by Calvin. But uh, again, the thesis is just that uh, religious belief can be justified or warranted apart from argument. And so I'm, I'm, as, a, as a Catholic, right, I, again, I'm, I'm a Catholic. So uh, I'm definitely not a Calvinist, <laughs> at least in its proper uh, understanding. I'm not a Protestant. And so but nonetheless, I still advocate for Reformed epistemology. Uh, I, I think that it's epistemically, uh, epistemologically plausible. And, uh, I, I think it's well even suited within the Catholic tradition. So no, yeah, I'm not a fan of the term. I wish, soteriology. I wish we had a better term. Sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, we we're, we're continue to talk past each other. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's get on to a, a, another question here. And this one is a really good one. It's really philosophical. Tomistica says, what do you think is the best response to the swamp man objection? And this is an uh, objection. Yeah, this is this is an objection, not necessarily to reformed epistemology, but to proper functionalism, which this is the type of reformed epistemology, the type of epistemological view that Tyler holds is proper functionalism. But you don't have to be a proper functionalist in order to endorse reformed epistemology. That's one of the points that that Tyler made very early on in this. So this is not a this is not necessarily an objection. To God being properly basic, to, to belief in God being properly basic, it's not necessarily an objection to Reformed epistemology. This is a specific objection to a very particular view called proper functionalism. I just wanted to make that clear before you responded. Right, right. So, I mean, you can be an internalist, for example, so you think that you have to have access to evidence or access to those properties which confer justification. And so, uh, namely, you can be a phenomenal, uh, endorse phenomenal conservatism, which is basically the idea that, like, um, uh, if it seems to you, you have a seeming, you know, that P, and you're without a defeater for your belief that P, then you're, you have some justification for believing that P. And so if it seems to you that God exists, right, and uh, you don't have a defeater for your belief that God exists, well, then you have some justification for believing God exists. Guess what? You believe, your belief that God exists is justified apart from argumentation, right? It's based on these seemings or experiences that incline you to this belief. And so, again, just sort of going with what you're saying, you do not have to be a proper functionalist and to, to be reformed epistemologist. And again, I, I sort of uh, encourage those to check out either my religious epistemology elements volume or Andrew Moon's article, uh, uh, recent developments in reformed epistemology, I believe it's title, uh, to, to check this out even further. But uh, so again, proper functionalism, we, for right now, we can say the minimal thesis of proper functionalism is that uh, in order for a belief to be uh, warranted, uh, it needs to be the product of properly functioning faculties, right? And so again, you're talking about what do you mean by proper function? Well, you know, there's it's sort of like you have a, a design, a way for how it should should go about, and then it actually going about in that particular way, and there's no malfunction, and you know, so all, all these sort of uh, terms are related: uh, proper function and, and um, 
uh, malfunction and, and design plans and so forth. Uh, and so you might think, well, here, here's a scenario where you don't have to have proper function, and yet someone knows, someone has warranted beliefs. So imagine that, uh, I don't know, you're chilling in a swamp and uh, lightning strikes and all these crazy you know, accidents all occur and it just so happens that you, you die, <laughs> but uh, an identical replica of you emerges from, from all these crazy uh, conditions being in place. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll call him Swamp Cameron. And uh, Swamp Cameron has all the same beliefs that Cameron had, actually, right? And he has, in fact, uh, if you were to ask him, like, why do you think P? Why do you think that P? Uh, he would give reasons that seem co to correspond <laughs> to belief that P. And so he just kind of like walks around everywhere. You know, no, no one even knows that there's a difference. That this is Swamp Cameron. Everyone just thinks it's Cameron. You know, maybe Cameron continues to doing capturing Christianity uh, uh, videos and interviews and so forth. <laughs> uh, but you know, no one no one actually knows that this is Swamp Cameron. Everyone thinks that this is just Cameron. And so the idea here is that. Well, surely Swamp Man can't uh, have proper function. You know, design plans and proper function aren't the sort of things that can come from these crazy random conditions all occurring just so happen to be on the right sort of circumstances to bring about an identical replica of Cameron, right? And so um, here we have, a, we have a, a defeater for thinking that proper functionalism is true. Well, um, there, you know, Peter Graham I mentioned earlier, he takes a different approach than I do. He thinks that Swamp Man doesn't initially have a design plan, but sort of gains one after a few minutes in time. Uh, sort of his, his past history and how his faculties operated in the past. Um, uh, they sort of, uh, history sort of gives him a design plan. Um, I, I, that's not the view that I hold to. I don't, I don't think that necessarily works. Um, just articulating that right now to show that there are various different responses. Planning his original response to this was just to say that the scenario was metaphysically impossible. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually inclined to think that it is metaphysically possible, but I actually think it's a good thing that it's metaphysically possible. Uh, I actually think that Swamp Man isn't an argument so much against proper functionalism as for proper functionalism. And so contra the intentions of those who advocate for the Swamp Man objection being a problem for proper functionalism, uh, I, I think that uh, we have really good evidence from proper function um, based on uh, Swamp Man. And so... Uh, here are two quick ways, and if I'm taking way too long, please just shut me up. But uh, two, Keep going. two quick ways how I respond to this. Uh, and I laid both these ways out in my um, uh, Cambridge epistemology, religious epistemology volume, which is really short. Again, feel free 44 to, pages. Uh, if you want something. Yeah, yeah. You can read it real quickly. Um, the uh, one way is to say, well, what, what epistemologists are after? Right? They're after what's called a tight connection to truth. That's to say that they're looking for a tight connection between the belief being produced and that belief being true. There needs to be some sort of tight connection here. So another thing in the five views of volume, uh, both the classical foundationalist and myself, right? John DePoe, a good friend of mine, we both agree this. Like, yes, the epistemologist is after capturing this tight connection between the belief being produced and the belief being true. And so uh, when you think about it, though, I think that Swamp Man seems to lack this sort of tight connection. Uh, so his beliefs have no, uh, his, sorry, his faculties have no way in which they should operate, right? It's not as if his, he should form the belief, right? Swamp Cameron, it's not as if Swamp Cameron should form the belief that, um, you know, he's talking to Tyler right now, right? Or that James Harden is clearly the best offensive player to ever play the NBA, I'm just saying, right? It's not as if his, his faculties should be producing uh, these beliefs. It just so happens that they do. Uh, and, you know, if Cameron all of a sudden started uh, forming the belief that, I don't know, um, that uh, he was talking to an alligator right now, right, or that no one, he was talking to no one right now. I mean, it wouldn't be like his faculties are functioning improperly, right? There's no cognitive malfunction. There's no way in how his faculty should or shouldn't produce beliefs. It just so happens that in Swamp Cameron, he gets like super lucky and that all his beliefs happen, you know, to, just to be true. And it's, again, it's not as if his faculty should be producing these beliefs. And I think like when someone hears this, uh, you might get some sort of intuition that, wow, there is actually a lot of cognitive luck when you put it that way. 
when you put it that way, there does seem to be like Swamp Man's beliefs seem to be serendipitous. And uh, so you might be like inclined to think, actually, he seems like to lack this tight connection between the belief being produced and the belief being true. Like you want a tighter connection than that. Um, that's one way. Uh, there's one other real quick way that I'll mention. Um, so uh, Kenny Boyce and Andrew Moon uh, have a great paper, it's something like Cognitive Science Takes on Swamp Man or something. Uh, you can find it on um, uh, Phil Papers, I believe. Uh, anyway, um, in their paper, they say, well, what's, what's, what's central intuition, right? CI, what's the central intuition behind why people think that, you know, Swamp Man knows stuff? And so I think uh, what they say roughly and again, I might uh, miss a, sub a couple of details here. I'm just going off of memory here. But the rough idea is that uh, there's a cent the central intuition is that if a belief is produced uh, in the same sort of way in one subject as the other subject, <laughs> and they're both in the same sort of environment, and one subject knows, then it seems like the other subject would know as well. And so they, they, they think about a sort of a counterexample. To the central intuition, right? And they, they say, you know, imagine there's this um, uh, universe that our, our planet could be within our own universe. Uh, and due to quantum mechanics and quantum shifts and so forth, uh, whenever you look at a red object, uh, it exists, but whenever you look away from it, right, it doesn't, it lacks object permanence, it no longer exists. Now imagine that, uh, you know, there's this alien ship, right? It's going to buy, and it goes to Earth. And let's say that it sucks up, right? It, it abducts a, a young infant. And the young infant, due to cognitive malfunction, uh, forms the, uh, uh, or lacks a sort of belief. Like uh, the, the child thinks that uh, whenever um, there is something red not being looked at, it actually disappears, right? So you have red object, when the infant looks away, the infant thinks no longer is, right? And it's a malfunction because cognitive science shows us that belief in object permanence is something that young infants have, right? Uh, they develop quite this belief uh, quite quickly on in, in uh, their cognitive development. So, you know, this, this child gets abducted, right? Faculties aren't functioning properly. Take it back to, to their planet or their universe. And maybe they even put this baby, you know, call this baby Billy. And they put it side by side with this alien baby, call him Zork. Well, Zork and Billy, let's say that they're forming the, the belief in the same way, that when they're not looking at a red object, they form the belief that the red object no longer exists. And they're in the same environment. But still something seems odd here. Something seems uh, really lucky about Billy's belief that red objects uh, cease to exist when you know not being perceived. And so uh, the idea here that Andrew Moon and Kenny Boyce uh, talk about is that uh, uh, Billy's belief seems too lucky. And uh, given that his belief seems too lucky, uh, it seems like he doesn't know. But if he doesn't know, then we have a counterexample to the central intuition. And what explains him not knowing? Well, he lacks proper function. And so they actually think it's positive a positive argument for proper function. Uh, there's been recent work responding to this sort of argument um, that uh, uh, sort of objects to, to the, their way of thinking, and I've responded to this. And so, again, you can find all this in the elements volume. But, yeah, so that's roughly how I'd respond to uh, Swamp Man. Yeah, so, uh, so one thing that came to mind as you were talking was it seems like Swamp Cameron – actually has no beliefs because he's purely physical, at least if you're a dualist. So this objection seems to actually assume physicalism. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so you, you can, uh, if you want, you can sort of, um, you know, uh, make it more dualistic friendly. So imagine that there's angels in heaven and, uh, you know, maybe there was some sort of uh, soul that was just created and uh, uh, the soul that was created, um, maybe it was like created by accident, right? Maybe like they were uh, putting um, you know, uh, sugar and spice and everything nice, right? Echoing Powerpuff Girls there. And you know, they were making something and some crazy accident happened and some soul somehow was made and it, you know, 
it spiritually blew up and just randomly fell into Swamp Man as Swamp Man was being created. Uh, you know. So now that seems like, metaphysically impossible. <laughs> so I may have to agree with planning on okay, that one. Okay. Okay. But so yeah, I mean, you can say things like that, or I don't know. Um, say things like uh, if you're an emergent dualist, maybe you think that as long as you have the biological properties, right, in such a way, right, emerges from these biological properties, this sort of these mental properties or an emergent, an emergent substance. Uh, so you might think that, uh, uh, but if you're like a Cartesian dualist, um, you know, where the soul's not just Which the form you are. of the body, body soul composite. Uh, I'm not a Cartesian dualist. I'm a, I'm a Thomistic or hylomorphic dualist. Gotcha. Uh, but if you're like a Cartesian dualist, I, it does get a little, uh, I think, um, uh, it becomes a little bit more of a confusing situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I, I I think the other situation is possible, but if if you know because uh, you're a weirdo, you well, <laughs> if, if you don't, then uh, uh, you know then um, Swamp Man objection doesn't have any problem with you to begin with, and you don't have to worry about it. So it's not an objection to proper functionalism. Okay, uh, let's get to a couple more questions. This one is from JGF. I'm not going to try his name. He says, what if I have a properly basic belief that the sun revolves around the earth? Is that what the idea of properly basic leads to? Right, so I don't know. Maybe you have the the belief that the sun revolves um, around the earth, or maybe you have the belief that the sun's like stands still. I mean, that the earth stands still, right? I mean, because let's face it. Uh, I don't think most of us sort of perceive the the Earth's moving at an incredible rate. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I mean, maybe you think that it would be a basic belief, right? You sort of just find yourself having it. Um, and uh, it's not based off arguments. But nonetheless, there are defeaters, right? So now if all of a sudden all the scientists in the world tell me, actually, um, uh, the Earth revolves around the sun, not the sun revolves around the Earth. And actually, the Earth, it, it's moving at an incredible rate. It's not standing still being tilted on axis going going around the, the, the sun and so forth and when it does this uh you know in about 365 days it circles again and, and again and you know they, they tell me this and i'm just like okay well i guess what seemed to me to be the case is just wrong and so like the idea isn't that what seems to us to be the case um leads to beliefs that we can't be wrong about right i reject that epistemology as i mentioned earlier the idea is it's, it's more like our beliefs are innocent until proven guilty. It's like a good justice system. Uh, you can sort of trust your experiences and, until you have a defeater. And so uh, in that case, you know, it might be basic, uh, might be properly basic on certain definitions. Uh, but, you know, it, it, I, I, it ultimately isn't immune to defeat. And so similar to when you're discussing about talking about religion, if somehow I don't really know how this would happen, but if somehow you're able to like show for like really good evidence that like, here are the bones of Jesus, <laughs> you know, maybe you have a defeater for Christian belief, or maybe you develop some sort of argument against God's existence. And you think about that and you reflect on that and you're just find yourself thinking, no, I, I, God doesn't exist. Yeah. Defeaters. You can formulate defeaters just because it's properly basic does not mean that the belief is immune to defeat. All right. So here's a really important question. How can you trust an epistemology devised by a man who doesn't even know how to operate an air conditioner? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's true. So uh, Mickey is referring to a really great video on YouTube. Um, so uh, Plantinga calls this, by the way, the AC model. And so the idea is from Aquinas and Calvin, right? So Aquinas and Calvin both talk about how um, God, belief in God can sort of be immediate, uh, can, can be known apart from argumentation. And so he calls it the AC model. Well, really funny is planning a, his air conditioning actually broke. And I guess randomly his house was chosen, uh, to, uh, talk about the heat, uh, uh, in the area in his neighborhood that he was at, um, in South Bend. And I'm assuming that's where he was at the time. And, uh, yeah, and he doesn't know how to operate an AC, and it's just so many like levels of irony. It's just great. Um, so if you get bored, you can YouTube plenty of <laughs> AC. Good. All right, we have another question from Harley Wikes. She says, "Can Reformed epistemology justify the inspiration of the Bible in the incarnation of Christ? What about specific doctrines like the authority of the papacy?" Ah, uh, you know this leads really well into tomorrow's segment. <laughs> uh, 
so uh yeah so uh long story short no i i think that's that's right i think that you can just justify or talk about you know having positive epistemic status um i believe possessing positive epistemic status uh regarding the extended um, AC model. right right uh the, regarding the inspiration of scripture and so let's say that um the church testifies or the spirit of God testifies or both testify um, to you, to you <laughs> that, you know, this is scripture or that this is infallible scripture. Right. And you just sort of find yourself believing that maybe the Holy spirit's even like moving you to believe that. Yeah. That, that, that seems epistemically possible to say epistemically possible is to say, as far as we know, you know, assuming um, uh, the sort of standard beliefs that you and I are going to accept. Right. Um, it seems possible that, that this could occur. And so uh, same thing with the incarnation of the, you know, church teaches that Jesus is uh, uh, what it means to be God and also what it means to be man. Uh, he has this hypostatic union and we accept that testimony in conjunction, especially with our own reading of scripture. And we're like, yeah, that seems right too. And, you know, we have two sources of warrant there that are coupling together and doubling together. Yeah, it seems possible. And the papacy, I mean, uh, maybe you grew up and your family told you that uh, there's this Pope figure and uh, he's the vicar of Christ and he's sort of like the prime minister of uh, the kingdom of, of heaven, Jesus' kingdom. And uh, you just kind of accept that. Or maybe you read scripture and the spirit moves you to interpret scripture in such a way where um, you find you just sort of find yourself believing this, uh, that, that, you know, Jesus established the papal office. Um uh, through, through Peter. Uh, I think one way that also happens quite frequently um, with people who aren't familiar with arguments uh, or apologetics, you know, they just sort of enter in a church uh, and this, they, they say papacy, so I'm going to come at this a little bit more catholically, if that's okay. But, um, you know, they sort of enter a Catholic church, they see its beauty and uh, they hear a homily that, you know, expresses the beauty of Christ and the beauty of the church. And they just sort of find themselves believing that, you know, Catholicism is true. I mean, I, I think the, these, these are all ways you could uh, talk about how Christian belief or Catholic belief or Orthodox belief or Protestant belief can all have sort of positive epistemic status apart from argument. All right. So I think that's going to do it for us today. We've uh, we've come a long way and we've, we've talked about a lot, but we don't want to keep tra uh, Travis Tyler too long here. He's, uh, we're actually, as he mentioned, we're doing a show tomorrow as well. And it's actually pretty late over there, but tomorrow he's going to try to convince me of Catholicism live. And so he's going to give me an argument. I'm going to react to it live and we're going to, we're going to have a good dialogue. So you definitely want to make sure that you watch that or attend it. If you're watching this live, you'll probably be able to attend uh, tomorrow's live stream live as well. But if not, they're both available right now. So you can just go in and click on it. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot more that can be said in defense of Reformed epistemology, about Reformed epistemology, about the idea that belief in God can be properly basic. It's an area that I love. I love thinking and talking about epistemology with people. I don't get to talk about it enough on this channel, but whenever I have the opportunity, I love to be able to do it. But Tyler, it's been great to have you on. Really looking forward to our conversation tomorrow. Is there is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with? Uh, good epistemology covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, if you're just interested in following my work, uh, you can go to tylermcnab.com or add me on Facebook and ask me questions, and I'll try to get to them. And uh, also, uh, uh, one of my former graduate students, Mike DeVito, who is also a former lineman, starting lineman in the NFL for nine years, uh, and I, we have started a YouTube uh, channel called Furthering Christendom. And so if you want to see more videos of me, feel free to check me out uh, there with Mike. So if you feel like, you know, hearing about uh, how a uh, lineman can turn to like a brilliant philosopher, you know, that, that'd be <laughs> motivation enough to, to, to check us out. So. Awesome. All right. Well, let me talk to the audience real quick. Thank you guys for tuning in today. If you want to support this ministry, the way that you can do that is patreon.com slash capturing Christianity to make sure that we do continue to put out interviews like this and videos we're, I think this week we're at four videos, which is a lot. We're putting out a lot of content, and we need your support. If you want to help this ministry continue to grow and become uh, better and better and better, 
then patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. And in return, you get access to uh, something that we have right now, 12 apologetics courses for beginners, who Tyler McNabb was actually one of the teachers. And you can see that he taught a class on how can we know that God exists. And we talked a lot about the different fundamental concepts that are uh, involved in, in this show today. A lot of the stuff that we talked about was covered in this course that Tyler did for us. So if you want to get access to the 12 courses, then go support us on Patreon. And you can also, like I said, you're just going to be supporting the ministry. Make sure that we continue to operate and continue, continue to do work like this if you find value in it. So thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys later. Remember, Christianity is true. See ya.